Hi guys, this is Jason Zack from Nathaniel School of Music. In this lesson, we are going to figure out all the possible ways, at least all the ways that I can think of, to classify intervals from the point of view of, let's say, classical music, rock music, Indian classical music or even jazz music. So hopefully all these methods will help you understand intervals better and also use them creatively in your music. Before we get started, all of my handwritten notes for this lesson and all the other lessons we've ever done are waiting for you on our Patreon page. Do consider checking them out. And it's a $5 a month subscription which will help support the channel. And also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon for regular notifications. Let's get cracking. So first of all, an interval is defined as the distance, as they say, between two notes. Now, what I take from that is there are two notes. That aspect I understand, but the distance part I don't quite understand. That doesn't really make things very musical. Because if you take, let's say, a perfect fifth or a fifth from anywhere, in this case, A to E, the tritone is just one step down, but in terms of the vibe or the mood or the emotion, A to E sounds very calm, if you ask me, versus an A to D sharp or E flat. So even though they are very close to each other, the notes, and the distance is far apart from the root, or even if you take the seventh, or the tritone, or the the one which is very close, I don't think distance is a good definition for interval. So I would say interval is just defined as the vibe created when two musical notes collide. And I guess when we talk about musical notes, we are not going to talk about things other than the 12 notes that we have in life, namely A, B, C, D, E, F, G, the sharps and the flats. Totally 7 plus 5 equals 12. Okay, so the most obvious way to classify intervals might be whether you're playing the two notes under question together or whether you're playing the two notes under question one after the other. If you play them one after the other, you would call these as melodic intervals. And melodic intervals could either be ascending in nature, where you have a lower pitch and then the higher pitch, or descending in nature. So if you're branding this as a melodic interval, and if the name of the interval is a third, a, C sharp, major third. Now you could compute the major third either going la, la, up to the third or third to the root. So that's a descending interval. So ascending, descending. So that's melodic. Now harmonic intervals are where you play these two notes under question together. Okay, or as fast as you possibly can, or as close to each other the notes should be. Uh, on a guitar, it's very tough to play them exactly together because you're strumming, but yet it will be practically together or observed together. Because our human ear can't, can't make out the difference when the two notes are played literally together with just a few milliseconds gap between them. So harmonic intervals played together... Now, as a singer, you might find singing two notes together very tricky or in some, in most cases, impossible. So what you would then do is you'll have to collaborate with another singer or perhaps a choir. But on a violin, you can. I don't think you can do more than two notes on a violin. Uh, on a guitar, you can. On a piano, you can. And these are called as polyphonic instruments. So po instruments that can play things together and create things like chords are called polyphonic instruments while the instruments which cannot like the flute are called monophonic instruments the piano can play things one by one as well as together So the piano works as both monophonic and polyphonic in that sense. So that's the basic way of classifying intervals. I heard two notes together, so it's harmonic. I heard one note and then the next note. It's melodic. But then is the second note higher than the first one or lower than the first one? That you have to figure out by pitch. Or which is the point of reference in the first place? So if I take A to C sharp, 
is C sharp the point of reference or is A the point of reference? So if A is the point of reference, then irrespective of whether C sharp is played after it or A is played after it, A is decided by you or the ecosystem as the point of reference. So then C sharp has to be the third and this is a major third interaction. Okay. However, if you take A and C sharp, it doesn't necessarily have to be A being lower and then C sharp being higher. It could be C sharp being where it is and A going higher. And this is no longer called a third. This would be called as a sixth. Okay. So more on this in other videos. We've done a lot of other year training videos on intervals and a lot more theory on how you define each and every interval. So I'd link you to a few of those in the description okay so the next way to classify intervals and most of the classifications i'm going to give you in this lecture are going to be very binary this or that pretty much opposites melodic up down melodic one by one harmonic together so it's pretty much going to be plain and simple and the same thing for the next classification method, which is consonance and dissonance or what some of them call as tension and resolution. Okay. Now, I like to expand on this by saying there are there is tension in intervals. There could be resolution with certain intervals. There could also be anticipation. So it's sort of like, now what is the difference between tension and anticipation? Tension is more like absolute chaos. You need to get out of there. But anticipation is something you can kind of wait to get to the other side, sort of like you're in a traffic signal or you're on, a, you're on a bridge waiting to just go back to your hometown or whatever. And then you have intervals which I think you can't even classify. When you hear them, you just don't know. One day it could be stable, the other day it could be unstable. We call those as mystery intervals or at least I do. Okay, But broadly speaking, in classical music and even in jazz music, we classify them as consonants and dissonance. So an example of a consonance could be a fifth or a third. Okay. So if you if I take C and G, feels very stable in comparison with a dissonance, which could be C and F sharp. That's what we call as a tritone or C and D flat, which is called as a minor second or C and B, which is called as a major seventh. Okay, you'll also have other consonances. You could have a major third, could have a minor third, could have a major six, minor six. It's a consonance, but I put it more in that mysterious or the anticipation category. Then you have Sama, perfect fourth, and then Sare. I put the major second the perfect fourth and the minor seventh into the anticipation category because they tend to resolve. Minor seventh resolves to the major sixth or minor seventh would like to resolve to the minor sixth. Similarly, four goes to three or four goes to three flat if you want. Two could go to three as well, two could go to the major third. So in general, you can classify them as consonants and dissonance. Okay, let's move on. So intervals in different cultures tend to mean different things or in different use cases or in different uh, environments tend to mean different things. So first of all, the traditional way of looking at intervals would be with respect to the root of your song or your scale. So that would be, I call it with respect to key because there's a distinction in, in my opinion, between a key and a scale. A key is one of, is literally one of the 12 keys in music. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, B flat, D flat, E flat, F sharp, G flat, etc. While a scale is an assortment of what we call as stepwise intervals or stepwise motion to give you the scale which has seven notes. So for example, the major scale would be two steps, two chromatic steps, Another two chromatic steps, one chromatic step, two chromatic steps, two, two chromatic steps, 
and finally 7 to 8 would be 1 so between the 3 and the 4 there is 1 between the 7 to 8 there is one more so 2 2 1 2 2 2 1 when you're building a scale, a scale is an assortment of intervals, but it will have a key. So we have to distinguish between the key and the scale. So we could say we are in the key of G, but we are in the scale of G major. Or you can just say we are in the major scale and the key is G. But I guess in colloquial terms, you can just say G major or G minor, even though minor is the scale or Aeolian is the mode or um, Karahara Priya is the Raga, but the key will be something. It will be one of the 12. Okay, it's important to know that. So now you can, you can name intervals with respect to what I call the true root of the song. So if let's say A is the true root... Whatever note you play, whatever you ever do, will be built on this A. So, in Indian music, we have the swaras. Now, those are nothing but scale degree names. So, instead of calling it as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, which is annoying to say and sing, you rather say sa re ga ma pa da ni sa now you have to remember those words or those syllables with respect to the root so sa ga pa ga re ga re sa dha sometimes you have to jump sa dha but the dha is actually f sharp dha basically will mean the sixth degree so every note that gets processed in your brain will always be with respect to this sa or with the respect to the root even if it's not there like for example i could just sing ah. now I, I if you have perfect pitch which i don't you you, uh, you could guess that we are singing G. but calling it g will not be a great musical achievement you have to know that G is the minor seventh or the knee with respect to the A, A is the Sa. So, Sa, Ni, and you have two kinds of sevens. You have two knees. Sa, Ni, or Sa, Ni. You have the Komal and you have the normal Ni. Same story with the thirds. Sa, Ga, Sa, Ga, minor, major. Sa, Re, major. Sa, Re, minor. Then sa ma, sa pa sa ma. That's a sharp four. And then sa dha, flat that to get minor. Sa dha. So all of this is with respect to the root. So if you're singing, let's say a popular song. Sa sa pa pa dha dha pa. Ma ma ga ga re re sa. You see, all of the notes which I sang are accurate primarily because I have respected the tonic. I have respected the tonal center or the root of my song. So, sa, sa, ni, pa, da, ni, sa, sa, dha. So, even though my root of the chord changes to D, sa, it's still the sa, original sa, you could call. Sa, dha, pa. The, it's still the even though it's going lower the ma even though the chord changed it's still ma ma ga sa re ga ma re ni sa re ga sa okay so that's a great system and people across India and most of the eastern parts of the world will rely on it to a point that you'll have a Tanpura, you'll have apps also these days which give you the sa and the pa. They get that those they get a very floating version of that coming past you and to to give you the the stability and not to lose those pitches when you practice your work or perform a concert on stage. Okay, another way to classify intervals it is with respect to chords and inversions of those chords. That's more of a Western thing because Western music has a lot of chords and has counterpoint notes with notes. So if you take let's say a chord like D major. 
You can play it first of all in root position. D F sharp A, F sharp A D, A D F sharp. You can also do it in spread position. D A F sharp or F sharp D A or A F sharp D. So from here you have to know the positional value of each of the notes of this particular triad. So if you play D F sharp A, it's easy. You can get it as one three five. But then if you jumble it, where is the three? Where is the five? And where is the one? So thereby you're going to calculate intervals with respect to the root of that chord, not of the scale. So if you take a more complicated chord, like let's say this this one, mm, maybe. That's a seven. So la 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 la, and the root is C. If you go a bit more complicated, la 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 la, and if we spell out the intervals, it'll be one, three, five, seven flat, nine flat, because you already have a seven, so you have to call the two flat and nine. So it it makes more. logical sense to name all of these notes or to identify all of these notes with respect to the you could call the temporary root which is actually the root of the current chord under question in this case c so 1 3 5 7 9 flat and the good thing about this approach is la 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 i can change my 9 flat to 9 or la 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 i can change it to the 9 sharp so when you use chords and when chords change throughout the song especially in a harmonically dense song like a jazz standard or a gospel song each chord's root would be your reference point from there on you calculate the remaining intervals and then you get the quality of the chord major minor dominant minor major 7 what are the flavors is it a 9 flat 9 sharp 9 11 sharp 11 13 sharp 5 flat 13 etc okay and the last way i would like to classify intervals which people don't really have in official theory textbooks would be with respect to the neighboring notes so if you take the note f and if you want to just move in thirds let's say now the quality of the thirds can change depending on the sound i want major or minor but you see what's happening here each note i played is with respect to a third forms a big chord yes but we are moving in thirds so similarly i can do something like what happened here i did a third and then from here to here it was a fourth and now come down a second what will happen do 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 another second do 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 so this is how you now build a melodic phrase so i wonder why this is not in books because it's a very important topic to f- to start planning your next move from the current move pretty much like a game of chess if you think about it so with respect to a neighboring tone or neighboring note is a very important way of figuring out or responding to intervals so we have a lot of ear training lessons on our channel we leave you a playlist in the description do check out some of those lessons after we've uh, after you finished watching this one so let's move forward with our classification objective for the lesson the next thing is simple intervals versus compound intervals we've touched on it very lightly earlier simple intervals are intervals that are within the octave while compound intervals are beyond the octave now that's the definition but to make it to tweak it a bit better for you to understand hopefully simple intervals don't necessarily have a seventh as a reference point so it's just within the octave you figure out okay you have your third third fourth tritone fifth minor sixth major sixth seven flat major seventh major two minor two 
So you you just have two notes, but with a nine, eleven, and thirteen, there should at least be a seven. So if you are ever calling something as a nine, you need that seven. In this case, seven flat, and from here. If you sing a nine, by the way, a quick tip: nine is same as two. Played an octave higher or observed an octave higher. Eleven is same as four, and thirteen is same as six. So if I take nine, this feels very different than when I don't have the seven. See, this is just a normal major second, but with that seventh, there's a lot more character. Actually, even with the sixth. that feels more like a nine in fact we call this a 6 9 chord 6 slash 9 chord okay so that will be your nine you can now make it a flat nine sharp nine even though that's called a minor third uh, in classical theory it now functions as a sharp nine because there is a dominant seven there's a seven flat here same thing with 11 it could also be called like a c7 sus4 as a bigger chord that's a sharp sharp 11 because there's a 7 then that will be a 13 i could even add a third in there it becomes a nice 13 sound now this could be looked at as either a sharp 5 or it could be looked at as a flat 13 so those are compound intervals you should probably learn compound intervals once you've conquered simple intervals so moving on the other kinds of intervals would be diatonic versus chromatic or as some theory uh, locations say relative versus absolute diatonic intervals would basically be intervals from within the scale you're playing on with that root in mind while chromatic intervals would be where you're bringing in a few objects where you're bringing in a few flavors out of topic or out of the scale so if i'm generally on let's say a major all of these notes would form diatonic intervals with each other as well as the root or the sa so major second major third perfect fourth perfect fifth major 6th major 7th octave and similarly with respect to each other they are thirds but diatonic thirds as we call them now in this world of a major So you heard that I, I uh, sneaked in a G there and a C. Now I added an F, so I got a G in, I got an F in, and I got a C. So just for flavor, you're bringing in the G. and then coming back to so you could have a composition on on the major i can just add that lick here and there just to or maybe something in a bluesy context come back to the major okay so thereby it's mostly diatonic as most songs are and most songs will just stay diatonic throughout you don't have to add the chromatic intervals but yeah in some uh, hindustani ragas you'll have a lot of different flavor created by sometimes changing the third of the scale itself uh, i leave you a song which i have composed called onward bound where i've done a lot of this uh, interval modulation with chromatic so check that out so diatonic within the scale chromatic where you borrow from the rest remaining notes so if a scale has seven notes you borrow the remaining five and start using them the last way to classify intervals which i think is very important when you're building scales and when you're composing melodies just to think about like 
most of what I'm telling you will help you compose if you think of them in opposite. So should I do ascending? Hmm, I'm doing ascending too many times. So now let me do a bit of descending. You kind of balance the forces. Okay, everything I'm playing has too much of con consonance. It feels like I'm just chilling out in my in a sofa and doing nothing great why not have some dissonance why not have some chaos but not too much of that so you need that adventure uh, why should my intervals just be simple why can't i think of them with a 9 11 13 concept context can i br yes i'm enjoying everything from within my major or minor scale can i bring something else so the main thing to hopefully take from this lesson is just to think of these opposites and say what am i doing i'm currently doing this can i also do that which is pretty much going to be the opposite of what you were doing in the first place okay so the last way to classify intervals which i think is very common in jazz music when we improvise and analyze and transcribe music would be stepwise and leapwise motion which is in simple terms stepping would mean moving up or down in seconds so you would go major second or else minor second so if in fact when you build a scale you're building it in stepwise motion all of those are steps of two most of the seven note scales will have second intervals okay and leaping is from the third interval minor third or greater so when you compose a song you want a combination of both so somewhere oh so what happened there leap step down over, over step sorry leap because that was a third down over but descending leap so now we're using both words descending leap of third the rainbow the stepwise motion the rainbow way huge leap octave way up another leap up to the six high and then step down so if you look at all the great melodies that have ever been composed a great melody is something that stands the test of time so it's not something which just has this many views or you know th this many people like it it has nothing to do with that in my book it's more the actual longevity of the act of the tune of the piece of music as well so if you take songs like somewhere over the rainbow or any of the old musicals any of the gospel hymns if you take some of the old ancient hindus hindustani pieces if you take a lot of songs even if you take folk music from some of the earlier generations and a lot of the beatles songs almost every beatles song has a catchy melody if you study these melodies you'll realize they have a great combination of everything there's step and leap going on there's consonance dissonance going on this melodic harmonic obviously there's pretty much all these kinds of things going on in the artist's head and probably all they are thinking of is i'm doing this what else can I do? Or what's the opposite of what I'm doing now? That's pretty much it. So, hope you found the lesson useful. Hope you can use it in your composition. Hope uh, music theory got a bit easier or a bit more clear for some of you who are a bit uncertain of what these things are. And do stay tuned to the channel for a lot more theory, ear training, and even, obviously, piano videos. Thanks a ton for watching the video. Cheers.